this is just about uh, torturing RCU. And of course, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, RCU has caused some pain over a while, so it's natural for a lot of people to want to torture it. Uh, I, I do the most torturing of myself, so here I am. But uh, actually, I'd like to call for a round of applause and appreciation for the people that torture software. I just listed a few of the uh, projects that have found problems in my code that came to mind that fit on the screen. There's a lot more. The thing is, you know, RCU gets the press, but without RCU torture, it would not be what it is today. Uh, there's a huge amount of, of uh, benefit that RCU torture and these other test things provide as well. Uh, that really contribute to the robustness of the of the Linux kernel in general and RCU in particular. Okay, uh, of course there might be the opinion that people just you know shut up and let me ta start torturing RCU. It's tortured me enough. I want to get back at it. Okay, you know here you are. So it doesn't take much really. If you have a suitable system, you got QMU and KVM. Uh, I use x86. Uh, some people use ARM. Uh, there's been some PowerPC. Uh, although I don't run them myself, so I can't uh, speak to how well they work. But uh, set up your path. I don't normally set up the path, but it makes the stuff fit on the slide, so I pretended I did in this case. It's really easy. Once you've done that, kvm.sh, enter. And that's going to do 30 minutes of torturing on each of 19 scenarios of different cake and fig and boot argument parameters. Um, that means it's going to run at single threaded, so that means it's going to take about 10 hours. Uh, you know, 19 half hours plus kernel build time for 19 kernels. Um, and if you have a large machine, say you got 64 CPUs, the next line might be more appropriate. And what that's going to do is it's going to run as many scenarios as it can concurrently. And in this case, currently, that'll get you done in two batches. So an hour plus 19 kernel build times. So a lot faster. Uh, on the other hand, if you have to tell it how many CPUs there are in all of your machines all the time, that gets really old. And so the next line shows dash dash all CPUs, just run as many CPUs as we got. Uh, and you can also specify duration, in this case, run them for a day, and you might do that for a weekend run. Uh, or you might have a really big machine, you only want to use part of it for torturing, so maybe you say CPU is 128, 12 hour duration, uh, and trust make so you don't uh, rebuild things unnecessarily. 128 CPUs is enough to do all the scenarios in one batch. You still do 19 kernel builds, but one hour of torturing uh, and get 19 tortures happening concurrently. In some cases you might, uh, for example, you might be annoyed at SRCU particularly, so you might want to torture just the SRCU aspects, SRCU scenarios. The next line, uh, 16 CPUs and run two each of those, uh, of those scenarios uh, and that'll get your default of 30 minutes torturing each. Now, one of the things that's gonna happen is you might be chasing a bug that happens at boot time sometimes not often. In that case, the kernel build time starts really getting painful. All right. And so there's something called KV KVM again. You give it a path, the old results, the output of a previous run would have said results directory and given you a path name. You take that path name, you throw it in as the first argument there, path to old run results, uh, maybe a duration of 45 seconds. So there's no kernel builds, it just uses the kernel you had previously. And you can run that over and over again very quickly and uh, just and much more quickly reproduce your boot time hang or panic or whatever it is. Uh, one of the really nice things, uh, thanks to my uh, employer, current employer Facebook, is that I can have lots of systems. And so there's something KVM remote that allows you to run a bunch of RCU tortures on a bunch of systems. In this case, we're showing a list of them. Uh, Sys1, Sys2, and Sys20 need to be names of systems you can non-interactively SSH do. I, I, okay, fine, you could interactively do it, but you're gonna be typing your password or doing whatever you do a lot. So I'd recommend making it so that it can just happen without human interaction. And in this case, uh, if each system has 80 CPUs, uh, the script assumes that all the, all the systems have the same number of CPUs. And then uh, in that case, uh, we're talking 20 times 80, uh, 1600 CPUs, you'll want to do uh, uh, a lot of scenarios, repetition of scenarios. In this case, dash dash config says tree 10, which isn't normally run. It's a fairly large, uh, a fairly large scenario, 56 CPUs, remember correctly, that's uh, non-preemptive. And then we're saying 15 times CF list says run everything, uh, everything you normally run 15 times. CF list is kind of a placeholder for all the normal, all the 19 that it does. 
Okay, so there's your instant gratification. You can just go right now and torture CPU, given a torture RCU, excuse me, uh, fairly thoroughly in different ways, given an appropriate system. Uh, there's going to be URLs at the bottom of the slide, as there is this one, and those are blog posts that describe the topic in more detail. So I'm not going to worry about that in the future, but there you have it right there. Okay, so how do I know it succeeded? Well, here's what success looks like. We have our 19 scenarios, one line for each, from root 01 to tree 09 there. It says how many grace periods were done. This is a fairly short run. Uh, and the next thing in parentheses is the number of grace periods per second. In square bracket is some uh, RCU flavor specific information I'm not going to go into. And on some of the scenarios, this is Nmax CBs, and that is a measure of how badly a callback flood affected the scenario in question. So in this case, the worst case was tree 03, and a callback flood generated uh, a little over a million callbacks stacked up on a CPU. All right. Uh, and then and really important is that if the test succeeds, you get an exit code of zero. So you really can feed this stuff to get bisect if you're crazy enough, and I have been from time to time, uh, and have it automatically uh, uh, do stuff there. OK, so that's what success looks like. Uh, but there's other things you can do. Uh, dash dash kconfig uh, specifies kconfig options. Maybe you want to run locked up on all of them instead of on the few that normally get it just by default. You can also specify boot arguments. Maybe you want to suppress CPU stall warnings or something. Uh, you can run under KA SAN, that's dash dash KA SAN or, or KC SAN. However, oh, with KC SAN, KC SAN is really powerful. It finds all sorts of interesting uh, uh, race conditions, data races, and so on. But it requires very recent compilers. So you know, make sure you've got the compilers. It will yell at you if it doesn't like the compiler you're doing and refuse to run. But it's uh, you should take a look. You can also torture things other than RCU. So if you're annoyed at locking or SMP call function, or you want to do scalability tests of one sort or another on RCU and other things, uh, use dash dash torture to do that. If you have a lot of CPUs um, or even a smaller number of CPUs, you may wonder, well, what can I get away with? How many batches is this going to take? And there's a dry run parameter with scenarios. If you do that, if you say dash dash dry run scenarios, it does not actually run the test. Instead, it prints out the batches it would have done and it prints a number with each of them. So you can see how many batches are going to be required. All right. Uh, and so this is some things you can do to run specialized tests. Maybe you want to torture something, but you're not sure what. You just like torture whatever you can torture. Uh, and the torture.sh script is there for you then. By default, this thing tortures a little of everything, uh, all the options pretty much. Uh, this ta will take about 12 hours on a heavy duty laptop. So it's maybe an overnight type of thing. And there's quite a few arguments to control this torturing. Uh, 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 for example, you can say do everything. Uh, when you By default, it does everything except for kernel concurrency sanitizer because uh, compilers for it are kind of rare. Uh, do all will say do that too. Uh, do none says do nothing, which you can then follow up with, with these other sorts of things to enable different uh, kinds of torturing. Okay, I'm not going to go into uh, detail on these other than to say that uh, on duration, uh, duration is kind of a funny thing. It's kind of a nominal duration. And uh, 10 minutes gives you about 11 hours on 16 CPUs. Uh, increasing it doesn't increase it that much. It does increase it. But the key thing is at that point, you're dominated by build time. So decreasing it doesn't help much either. Uh, but it allows you to, to do more or less. I use this in an acceptance test. I run this a couple times, and I especially run it before sending a pull request just to kind of do a general check. Um, I used to keep track of this in my head. Uh, there was some fun and excitement late last year that uh, was very distracting, and I wasn't able to keep my head anymore. Uh, there were some embarrassing escapes, so I wrote this script. Well, maybe you want to use a debugger. In that case, dash dash GDB is your friend. Here's an example where we said use all the CPUs. We want to torture the locking. We have to specify a specific scenario, lock 05 in this case, and tell it run the debugger. When you do that, it'll do the build. Um, and then at the end, it'll say, hey, I'm waiting for you to attach a debug session. It'll give you the command you should run for that specific kernel. Um, and then it'll also tell you what to uh, what to tell GDB to get things going. So target remote colon 1234 and continue. Now, uh, the restriction here is you only get to run one scenario. Uh, 
I just wasn't willing to put up with whatever would have to be done to allow multiple concurrent debugger sessions. And to be honest, I think you might be happy uh, to run one at a time instead of trying to manage, say, 10 GDB sessions all at once. The big difference, you can use GDB commands, it's great, except uh, using B or break doesn't work very well. Use H break to select har hardware breakpoints instead. Uh, the thing is, the Linux kernel doesn't really like GDB rewriting its binary to insert software deep breakpoint instructions. So use H break. Okay, so that's useful occasionally. Uh, oh, so you found a bug. Now what? Well, how about if you fix it and post the patch? Why not, right? Of course, life isn't always that simple. With RCU, Heisen bugs are kind of the common case. And uh, what that means is that before you can do much meaningful debugging in many cases, you're going to have to make the bug happen more often. This is more of an art than a science, but the next few slides will go through a few tricks that have helped a lot with me. Uh, one trick is really simple and really, really nice. You can adjust the CPUs and adjusting CPUs can increase the probability of failure by a factor of M, okay? And one way to do this, uh, and it depends on what the race is, if the race is between just random threads, then increase the number of threads by a factor of M, the number of CPUs in other words, it gives you an N squared increase in the probability, um, but you have N fewer uh, instances of the result. So you know, overall effect is you get MX fewer runs with more MX uh, more CPUs each, that gives you roughly a factor of M increase in failure probability. Uh, on the other hand, if the failure is always between a particular pair of threads, so you know the RCU CPU, the RCU grace period K thread, for example, and uh, you know some other single thread that's only one of in a given OS instance, in that case you're going to be a lot better by having many small OS instances. Uh, then you get a factor of M again uh, by a by an MX decrease, and uh, the diagram there kind of shows the theory there. This is theory, by the way. Um, the real world does what it wants, uh, but this doing this can help work out where the bug is. If you uh, make a lot of small OS instances and the bug probability goes up, that gives you a hint as to where the problem might lie. This actually is a special case of deep hikers bugging things. The general case is you want to make risky operations happen more frequently. Okay, and by adjusting CPUs, uh, we did that in a couple different cases in a couple different ways. CPU hot plug is a usual suspect for bugs. And so there's a boot parameter shown there that uh, makes it so that we only wait 200 milliseconds between uh, uh, CPU hot plug operations. By default, it's several seconds. So if the bug involves CPU hot plug, that can increase the bug frequency by a factor, uh, by also order of, mag uh, order of magnitude, excuse me. Okay, uh, long lived readers. Uh, by def usually in the kernel, the readers are so short that if the grace period takes any time at all, nothing can, nothing bad can happen. So RCU torture goes to as much effort as it can uh, to try to make very long grace, very long readers. Excuse me. Um, it has to balance that out because uh, if you have uh, too many long readers, your grace periods don't happen as often, and that can also decrease your bug rate. So it kind of balances it. Uh, if there are bugs that can only happen if RCU is spinning up from idle or going back down to idle. And so we do a full system idle in and out. That's the stutter parameter there. Uh, there's other problems only happen if there's massive um, piles of callbacks and the forward progress uh, thing causes that to happen. Now in both, case, both these cases and in the, third, the other one as well, the jitter one as well, uh, the scripting does this automatically for you. You can use these to control it if you like something, if you'd prefer something else to happen. Uh, the other thing I do is we force vCPU preemption. And uh, uh, the dash dash jitter does this. Uh, we got the next slide and uh, one question that came up, I very recently popped on the matrix. So if there's uh, people that uh, had questions before I started looking, you know, please feel free to turn your video on and yell them out. Uh, you know, I'd rather have questions while we're going along. Uh, Nur Hussain asks, "Does this be useful for those of those teeny tiny test machines? Well, uh, yes, actually. Uh, it's just that you'll be wanting to do things differently. So for example, uh, one of the scenarios, 303, 
wants 16 CPUs. But if you only have a four CPU machine, it'll take the four CPUs. It'll complain, it'll say, hey, you only gave me four CPUs, but it'll run, all right? Uh, so you'll still be able to do something. You, four cores, I don't know if that's eight CPUs or four CPUs, but either way, um, it'll, it'll, it'll use what it can, what it has, and it'll run what it can. Uh, there'll be some bugs you can't find that way. On the other hand, uh, those bugs can't occur on your setup anyway, so maybe that's okay. And, and besides, there's others of us that are running on large systems. Uh, and there's probably some bugs that only happen on small systems, in which case you'll find them and we won't. So uh, I think it works both ways. Okay, so jitter. Um, uh, the, uh, the way the jitter is working, what happens is we've got a hypervisor with QMU KVM or whatever there. Um, and we have RCU's torture scenarios that cover the CPUs. So if we had 12 CPUs and, and we had uh, four CPU scenarios, we'd have three of those to cover all the CPUs. Um, and then uh, what we do is we run a bunch of jitter, jitter at SH processes. And each of these processes is gonna randomly bind to a particular CPU randomly selected. And it's gonna force preemption. It's gonna, it's gonna spin for a little bit and then it's gonna sleep. And the cool thing is, is that this is going to preempt the CPU even if it thinks it has interrupts disabled. And so injecting delays like this can force bugs to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree with Vlastamil, but you know, uh, if you ran eight vCPU and four CPUs, you might increase latencies, uh, but except for one thing, what, uh, what happens, um, you could make that happen, but by default, RC torture scripting, and maybe this is a, this is a, maybe this is a, a problem that should be fixed. I don't know. Uh, right now, the RC torture scripting will say, "Oh, you've only got four CPUs, so I'll just run it as if it was a four CPU run." But that is an interesting point. Uh, it could well be that uh, we need to have some way of of overcommitting the CPUs. So that's an excellent point. All right. Uh, another thing is, uh, if you're running a whole bunch of scenarios, by default you run them all. And the bug tends to happen in a few of the scenarios. Well, just run those scenarios. And we saw dash dash configs allows you to do that. Uh, there's a script, uh, config.csv.sh, that will make a spreadsheet of the kconfig options and the boot parameters for the various different scenarios. And uh, that can allow you to sometimes look and see, well, what's strange about these scenarios? Oh, okay, I see. And sometimes that points you right to the bug. Uh, but in any case, uh, you can double down on the suspected accelerators, the things that are different about those scenarios, and specify kconfig options or boot parameters to, to make it more whatever the way it is. In some cases, I've had to modify the kernel or the scripts in order to really force things to happen more often. Uh, the other thing we do to make things happen faster, we KVN, uh, RC torture does not run in user space. I mean, it could run in user space, and it'd be in some sense more natural. The problem is, is that we'd be we have a whole bunch of overhead for each RCU operation, and we have no really control over what RCU does. We, we can't have long readers, for example, unless the kernel happens to generate long readers. So we don't do that. Instead, RCU is a kernel module. It directly calls the APIs, and it does uh, rather strange and abusive things to try to force things to happen, which it can do in this mode. It would be very difficult to do from user space. Uh, another trick is to enlist, the, to enlist the aid of the laws of physics. Now, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed this uh, when I was much younger, but today, I'm sorry, the speed of light is just too freaking slow and the atoms are just too freaking big. And because of this, we have these memory latency and NUMA effects that cause us so much trouble. Okay, uh, well, if there's trouble, when I'm testing, I want trouble, so let's enlist the trouble. And a fair, real, quite recent change to the RCU's torture scripting is that it places the RCU torture guest OS CPUs to maximize difficulty. So we take two CPUs and we put them into one core and we take an, the next two CPUs and put them in another core, preferably on some other socket. And what happens then is that the latency between the CPUs in the, in the same socket is much, much less than between different socket. And, uh, as Vlasmo pointed out, the changes in the latencies can cause additional bugs to appear. And for certain types of race, uh, uh, races, this can happen. Uh, I, I did this fairly recently and, and the effects were not subtle. Uh, 
Uh, I don't have time to go through the things, but the, the URL at the bottom goes through some of some one of the strangest bugs I've come across. Uh, RCCP stall warning times are set to 21 seconds. Once I made this change, I was getting 2,199.0 second RCU stall warnings occasionally, but always that number. As in the difference in time was, was in the tens of milliseconds and a small number of tens of milliseconds. Uh, that took me some time to track down. It was uh, quite entertaining, but uh, we don't have time for that now. Uh, of course, if you're going to torture something, you need to know what it's supposed to do. And that's where semantics can come in. This is a graphical representation of RCU semantics, which are rather simple, actually. Uh, so if we have, if we look at the upper left-hand corner there, over here, we've got uh, RCU unlock the end of the uh, end of the reset critical section happened before we freed the memory in which case it's okay if that reset critical section saw the memory that was to be freed if we go over to the right hand side in this case we've got a case where our read lock started after the removal that means the reset critical section can't see the stuff that was removed so it's okay for that reset critical section to extend past the point that stuff that it couldn't see was freed in the lower left, we have the belt and suspenders approach where we both couldn't see the memory removed and we weren't around when it was freed and that's perfectly fine as well. What's bad is in the lower right here. If we have a read side critical section that saw the stuff that was removed and was still hanging around after it was freed, that's really bad. That's a bug in RCU. Uh, that'll cause all sorts of horrible problems. You, you just don't want that happening. Okay, another way of looking at this is from an API viewpoint, and we can also state these semantics very simply. An RCU grace period must wait for all pre-existing RCU readers. And this, I'm not gonna go through it line by line, but this thing uh, really does work in the Linux kernel. It implements RCU, or at least a portion of the API. Uh, it's in RCU torture. RCU torture tests this thing from time to time, uh, the trivial scenario. As you can see, the readers are very lightweight, uh, and the update is very simple. So, you know, why not do something simple? This is simple. We like simple Linux kernel. Why not do this? Well, uh, unfortunately, this is the Linux kernel. And so there are a few complications. Uh, this is what fit on the slide. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, each of these things is worth a few hundred lines of code, maybe a thousand lines of code. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the last one just to talk about something definite. RCU should avoid explo exploitable ease of use issues. And it turns out this is no longer a theoretical possibility. There was a Linux Conf uh, AU presentation on a couple of years ago. Um, and what it was, is I used to think that RCU was uh, so low level that it wasn't hackable. Uh, and I've since, I, I, when Rohammer showed up, uh, I started deciding that wasn't the case. And then when this thing showed up, I knew it wasn't the case. But the effect, uh, the relevant effect for this presentation Back in the old days, there were multiple flavors of standard RCU. There was the thing with RCU read lock and RCU read unlock, and you use synchronize RCU to wait for that. And then there's preempt disable and preempt dis enable, and you use synchronize sched to wait for that. And uh, another example over here, there was also BH disable and BH enable, and you used synchronize RCU BH to wait for that. So you had these independent, three independent flavors of RCU, uh, and you had different update size to wait for them. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, exploitable problem was somebody waiting, using the wrong weight with the read side, uh, and that caused all sorts of problems. Uh, uh, in some sense, this was their fault, not mine, but uh, Linus, to his credit, said, hey, Paul, can you make this not happen again? Uh, which uh, it took me a year, but I did. And so right now what happens is that all of these different readers are the same thing. So you just do synchronize RCU and it waits for all of them. And that means it needs to keep track of the overlapping things. So yeah, we have a reader started here and ended here, except we had one starting here. So we have to wait for the whole thing, all right? And likewise, we have three of them overlapping. We have to wait for the whole thing. We have to kind of flatten into one reader. Um, and that means our RCU torture must randomly generate overlapping readers, which it has for some time. I, I realized that was a vulnerability. I put that in uh, at the time that I made this change, except that I, for got something. I forgot to include just nested RC read lock readers. And uh, I actually added that this week. There were a number of really embarrassing uh, bugs that had slipped by. 
uh, they were in situ you had to ha you had to work hard to get them so I don't know that anybody's seen them in production but but still uh, if you don't test it it has, doesn't work uh, I think I fixed those by now uh, we'll see how it goes uh, actually I've got I've got uh, yeah I've got one I'm still testing so in short if we look at that simple implementation a few things back was like less than 20 lines of code uh, that's kind of like the little puppy dog there it's cute it's elegant it's wonderful it's warm it's soft it's friendly what's not the like well what's not the like is this poor thing's just not going to survive in the context of the Linux kernel it just doesn't stand a chance the Linux kernel is going to run right over it without even know, knowing it was there if you want your synchronization primitive to survive in the Linux kernel a uh, little puppy dog isn't going to cut it instead you need something like this okay uh, this might have half a chance of surviving the Linux kernel so what that means is the semantics, the, the, the semantics we expressed, and it can be expressed, expressed mathematically, has been. We did a, a bunch of us did a 2018 paper expressing them that way you know, with executable formal semantics. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole pile of other stuff underwater, not visible to the mathematics that has to be dealt with as well. Now, you could interpret this as be dissing the formal verification people and, and to be quite frank with you, there's a fair number of them that certainly deserve some serious dissing, but that's not really my intent here. Not this time anyway. The key point is that this is actually an improvement. A few sh short years ago, this entire thing was underwater. There were no formal semantics for any part of RCU. It was all informal. So this is an improvement, uh, a significant improvement. And who knows, maybe a few decades from now, uh, we'll have most of the iceberg above water. I'm not sure I'll be alive to see it, that, but that might happen. Here's hoping that uh, the enough formal semantics people take this sort of thing seriously and they make this sort of thing happen. There's also a software engineering viewpoint. And the key thing here is that RCU software, it's got some number of lines of code. There's industry statistics that um, quite frankly, from watching myself program for more than 40 years, you know, one to three bugs per thousand lines of code is pretty good for me. Now, you can do better. I've seen a project that did, I kid you not, 0.04 bugs per thousand lines of code. So that's one bug per 25,000 lines of code. But this was a safety critical application. They had extreme code style restrictions, stuff, and it was single threaded only. They used formal methods, the whole show. And even with all that, they had way more than zero bugs. Another thing that should be of some concern is that RCU changes. And so the median age of a line of code is less than four years. This is one of those rare circumstances where old stuff is more reliable than new stuff. What this means is that we know that there's a few tens of, of bugs in the Linux kernel RCU. They're in there somewhere. You don't know where they are, but there are bugs there. Now, you remember that successful RCU torture test I showed you near the first of this paragraph of this presentation? That was not a success. That was RCU torture failing. We know that there are bugs remaining in Linux kernel RCU, and that RCU torture run failed to find them. So at every point, there is a first class bug, either against the soft runner test or against the test suite. Let's look at it from an installed base viewpoint. You know, that's bad enough, but it's even worse. I'm going to use my experience, my first, uh, I guess, sort of professional software effort pro bono was for the National Honor Society in 1975 uh, when I was senior in high school. It was a computer dating program. Uh, if we had a million year bug in that, it took take a million years to find it. Uh, as it turned out, we did have a bug. Uh, I was made aware of it when a very irate senior girl came complaining bitterly about the fact that she'd been assigned four freshman boys as her dates, uh, despite the fact that she'd indicated a strong preference for upperclassmen. Uh, I, in retrospect, you know, it might have been a mistake to allow the data entry to be done by the freshman boys, but, you know, live and learn. Uh, John Grove suggests rewriting RCU and Rust. Um, well, uh, I've, I've asked questions many times, uh, actually pointed in that direction. I never get answers. So. You guys answer my questions and maybe we make progress on there, okay? But if you're going to ignore me, <laughs> I'm going to ignore you. Good luck. Um, so uh, 
again, uh, everything can happen will, maybe in geologic time. Murphy's actually kind of a nice guy if you only got one instance. Uh, the number of instances I went on increased. I was doing process control stuff in 85. Uh, sequently, we had 6,000 systems. You know, we're still, a million year bug doesn't happen very often. Uh, I don't know how many instances of 2005 Linux there were, but call it 10 million. At that point, we're having this million year bug once a month across the installed base. And uh, well, at this point, we're certainly not leaving the bugs to our grandchildren, uh, unless our grandchildren are already live and already coding and, and debugging, in which case, well, maybe we are. But, uh, uh, or if we have, if we have uh, grandchildren very young. Uh, smartphone showed up. Uh, suddenly we're getting million year bugs several times a day. In uh, 2017, a gentleman from ARM told me that there were 20 billion instances of Linux in the, in the world. And that was billion with a B is in 10 to the ninth power and 20. At that point, we're doing it uh, several times an hour. And you know, it could get worse. If the Linux kernel even gets a small fraction of IoT, uh, we could be at a trillion, no problem. And at that point, I got a question. Has Murphy transitioned from a nice guy in, in 1975 to a homicidal maniac in say 2025? And I don't know about you guys, but I would feel really, really bad if my software killed somebody. So uh, this is a matter of some concern to me. So this has kind of been the bad news. Um, maybe we should try something else. Uh, natural selection is, I mean, it's certainly done an incredible job of making some really strange things happen in living things, both good and bad, but still very complex. Now, of course, uh, no discussion of natural selection is complete without a photo of the great man. And there's Charles Darwin to look over the proceedings. And the thing is, uh, this was living things, but as we've since learned, these living things are governed by DNA, which has sequences of amino acids grouped into four amino acids per codon. So uh, what Charles Darwin was seeing was natural selection of software, software of a sort. So if Charles Darwin's natural selection applied to software, why don't we do it with computer software? So let's give it a shot, right? Um, some of you may object uh, to the upper left-hand box where I'm accusing you of randomly generating your software, but you know, I've been at this for more than 40 years. If you want me to characterize your work differently, behave in such a way to prove that characterization wrong. Um, you know, have at it. Uh, but randomly generated or not, uh, we apply a validation suite that does our selection function. It generates bugs. We fix them and hopefully inject fewer bugs than we fix. If we do that enough, we should end up with robust software dropping out the bottom. You know, that's, you know, what could be better? There is, of course, a problem with this. You see, natural selection applies to software. Guess what? One type of software is a bug. Therefore, we don't end up with just robust software out the bottom. We end up with the software and also bugs that have adapted themselves to our validation suite. Uh, this is also not a theoretical issue. Uh, some years back, uh, I got a report from a guy in Russia saying, hey, you know, I'm running a heavy workload and I'm getting RCU errors. And I looked at the stack trace and I mean, it was pretty clearly RCU at fault. Uh, so I asked him for his .config file. Silence. Uh, a few months later, I got another report from somebody in Australia who also was heavily loading their system and, and getting the occasional RCU problem. Also, the stack trace showed it was pretty clearly RCU's fault. Uh, great, can I have your .config file? Silence. For a couple of weeks. Then the guy from Australia comes back. He's generated a huge, uh, this is before no, tracing we have today, he made this trace, tracing infrastructure trying to find a deep dark bug in the guts of RCU. And instead, it was just a stupid initialization problem. Uh, what happened is if CPU hot plug was disabled, RCU would decide there were no CPUs. And so when you said start a grace period, it would just click through a state machine, uh, taking a fixed period of time, about three milliseconds or three jiffies, I should say. Uh, waiting for no CPUs to get done. And so if you had a really heavy load, that was a problem. The thing was, I was testing that, except that there had been the addition of hibernation and suspend resume. And hibernation and suspend resume were enabled by default, and they selected CPU hot plug. So I had not been testing CPU hot plug. I'd been whittling for quite some time. Uh, that was a hole in my validation suite, and a bug adapted itself to it. So. You know, we have to do something more here. We have to take bug reports such as that one and improve our validation result. 
And yes, right now RCU torture, if the K config, if the dot config file comes out differently than it expects, it screams uh, as a result of this experience. But even this isn't necessarily enough. I mean, this, this helps, but it's not enough. You see, normally you validate only your intended use case. Um, only a few of us crazies validate things we don't expect to happen. And that means you do a major development, you generate a whole bunch of bugs, you validate them, you fix those bugs, and you end up with some bugs left over that nobody cares about maybe. And then you do more development, you fix more bugs, and then you end up with more use cases that are excluded because there's this wall of bugs preventing your software from, from addressing them. So uh, in some cases, you don't have any choice. You've only got so much time and effort and and clearly, if you only got so much time and effort, you should prioritize the ones affecting your current users over bugs that might affect somebody that isn't there yet and might affect nobody. Uh, but if you have the luxury, you should go a little further. And uh, so uh, I add paranoia uh, to those bug reports. And it turns out that the fuzzers, Trinity and, and Syscaller, for example, are actually pretty good at this, at uh, finding things we haven't imagined. Uh, and both of them have found bugs in RCU. So, you know, good on them. So natural selection might help us, but it's important to realize that natural selection is kind of this funny euphemism. And to understand what that means, I invite you to consider what happens to individuals who are not, not selected, okay? Not quite so pretty. The key point for us though, for software, is if your tests are not failing, they are not helping improve your software, all right? so. Uh, this is why tests tend to kind of become less effective. What happens is the bugs adapt to those particular tests. Unless those tests are maintained and developed as well, they become obsolete and no longer help you. All right. So the price of robust software is eternal test development. So in summary, we've talked about torturing RCU. We've uh, talked about using GB as an example. Uh, we've talked about how you can help track down Heisen bugs. Uh, we've talked about the role of RCU semantics, perhaps more limited than one might hope, but still there. And we've talked about validation, including uh, the good, bad, and ugly of natural selection. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to come full circle. I'd like to end this presentation where I started it. I'd like to call for a round of applause for testers, because without them, uh, our software would not be anywhere near as robust as it would be. But this time, I'd like to focus on one specific group of people that have tested software. I'm talking about these guys. These guys are hardcore. You do not want these guys angry at you. I mean, I mean, yeah, sure, you know. Uh, they torture the software with new workloads, so they probably stress tested for all I know, but that wasn't enough for them. You know what these guys did? You know what these guys did? They banished the software, banished it to Mars. So with that, uh, that's the end of my material. Uh, I've got a couple things here, a couple slides with more information. The first slide talks about uh, tricks I've learned over uh, 30 years about of, uh, of validating software. And uh, 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 RCU in particular, of course, but also concurrent software in general. And then uh, the RCU specification, which is a function of time, some things about my experience with that. With that, if there's questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions, bug reports, uh, fixes would be even better, uh, you know, have at it. Now just go ahead and uh, enable your video and talk. Uh, I'll, uh, I don't see any new stuff in the chat. And I, I do appreciate the virtual applause. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll admit I miss face-to-face -face presentations, but hey, uh, this uh, I also want to thank uh, the people that made this possible. Uh, uh, getting this stuff working is not easy, uh, and uh, it's a learning process, and there was a lot of work there. So thank you guys for making this happen. And uh, thanks to the rest of you, uh, all of you actually, for your time and attention, and hopefully this helps, helps you uh, do your own software and uh, helps you find bugs in my software or maybe even fix in my software. I'm not proud.
Well, if there are no questions, uh, I'll hang out here uh, and uh, uh, for another another five minutes until we start the break. Uh, but uh, here we are. Cool. I think I have. Wait. Let me turn on the video. I think I have a not very technical question. I guess. Like, how do you? Uh, because you said like you worry about your software killing people. Uh, not uh, literally. Uh, but <laughs> literally, you know, I mean, look at what Linux is used for. Uh, and those SpaceX rockets, those got those got XA60 fuse running Linux, my friend. Do you still? I mean, still, when you when you discover a bug in in RCU, for example, it's 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 just something that you go and fix, right? It's not something that you really worry about. Well, uh, that's a good point. Uh, the thing is, is, I could flagellate myself, and and sometimes I do. I mean, there was a bug that uh, that hole in uh, RC torture wasn't testing nested things. Found just a really really stupid set of bugs, and yeah, I kind of beat myself up. But uh, and that's good. It kind of emotionally prepares you to think harder. You know, it, it's too easy to be overconfident. Yeah, I know how this works. I'll just do this. It'll be great, right? right. And uh, you have to have that overconfidence because otherwise you'll never do anything. Yes. But at the same time, you have to kind of you punch it occasionally. Yes. Yeah, because you, you do have to actually, yeah, I might have made a bug. I do need to write tests. I do need to hammer this hard. Uh, and so there's a balance. If you do too much, if you do too much self-flagellation, you'll just be self-flagellating. You won't get anything done, and then you're no good to anybody. Okay. If you never do any, then you're probably you're probably at least inflicting bugs on people and possibly much worse things. Yes. Good question, though. It's uh, it's a hard balance to strike. Uh, Gotham Shinoy asks, "How do I ensure that RCU torture has no bugs?" and it's a piece of software. It's got bugs too. Uh, so there's, and in fact, uh, it has had bugs. Uh, one of them I described, where I was testing overlapping read side critical sections, but failed to test nested read side critical sections. Uh, back in the day, before a few years ago, there wasn't really any kind of bug you could have in that arena. But uh, task trace RCU, and it, oddly enough, tiny uh, tiny SRCU. Uh, has one now. I could argue the tiny SRCU one is a locked up false positive, and I'll be sending a patch out later on that. Uh, but RCU torture can have bugs. It can have bugs where it gives false positives, where it complains about things that aren't real. It can have bugs where it misses things. Uh, one one thing I did a while back, uh, uh, I worked with some guys at Oregon State University. Thank you. Uh, that uh, and what they did was they uh, did mutation testing. What they did was they had a program that automatically generated mutations of uh, the RCU code itself. And then they ran RCU torture on it. Uh, they did a bunch of other things. For example, there's some changes you make that don't change the binary. So they checked for those. Uh, and then they would run them. They build first. And if it got a build error from the change, they said, great, the, the suite caught that. If RCU torture complained in two minutes, they'd say, yep, great, RCU torture got that. The ones that survived, they ran for a little longer. And the ones that survived that, which there were actually fairly few, uh, they handed off to me. And uh, it was my job to take a look at the bugs, the changes, and say, no, that's not a bug, or that is a bug. And they did find some bugs in RCU torture as a result. And some of those bugs were, in fact, hiding real bugs in RCU. So they can happen. That's one. That was kind of a tour de force. I don't see doing that all the time, although I, I have known some projects where the maintainers said they were going to do it periodically. And good on them, right? That's an excellent thing to do. Uh, but, but yes, uh, there can be, can be bugs in RCU torture, just like there are bugs in RCU. And we have ways of chasing them. And it's not perfect either way. Did projects like RCU torture and, for example, LockDep start because you had there were bugs and it needed to be fixed and we that it wasn't when supposed to be regressed, or was it paranoia from the get-go that you like that people said, okay, we need something like LockDep and RCU to just be on the safe side? So in the case of RCU torture, um, there was a thing called TLB test uh, back in Dynex PTX days, and uh, the problem was is that uh, that was kind of both. As I developed RCU, there were bugs. And it's kind of like, if there are bugs in this thing, it's going to be really, really hard to find them. They'd look like memory corruption. And so I extended TLB test to cover RCU. 
And then by the time we got to Linux, I knew it was needed, so I made one uh, a few years after it got accepted. Uh, LockDep, uh, I think that was, I was not one of the people that uh, started LockDep, although I very much appreciate it and use it heavily and it's great. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that was there because we're getting a lot of deadlocks and, and we wanted to find them more quickly. Uh, Bruno Larson uh, asked if we thought about automating natural selection, uh, adding mutations to the test cases, kind of like smart fuzzing. And uh, actually you can think of RCU torture as doing that a little bit today. Uh, there's a lot of, it uses a lot of randomness. So it'll randomly decide how long a reader should be. It'll uh, uh, randomly decide what operations do in what order. Uh, but the fuzzers, uh, Trinity and, uh, and more recently, Syscaller, uh, really do take that to an extreme and do that a lot more. Uh, the stuff they do doesn't apply to RCU. I mean, you know, what the fuzzers will do is they'll, they'll grab an open call and feed, feed it random garbage. The problem is, is that the RCU's APIs don't have much uh, possibility of doing that sort of thing. I mean, RCU read lock doesn't take any parameters, so what are you going to do, right? Uh, uh, RCU uh, assign pointer takes a pointer, and if you fuzz a pointer, uh, you're probably testing your uh, exception handling more than RCU. But nonetheless, we can fuzz the timing of the calls, and we do that. So that's an excellent thing. People do it, and uh, it probably could be done more. Uh, Dave Hansen says the locked up, as far as you knew, was a, was a uh, <laughs> problem of, uh, of people being tired of chasing deadlocks, essentially. Yeah. So yeah, I believe you, Dave. Cool. Uh, I think uh, we're at the end of the talk and uh, you can continue uh, this discussion for a bit because we have a 15 minute break and we'll continue uh, at the full hour or you just move it into an, a hack room if you want to keep on discussing. Okay. Uh, I'm open either way. Uh, I, I have some time after this, but uh, up to you guys. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's the dark side of tests. Uh, uh, they give false positives or otherwise cause annoyance. Uh, or you may want to get things kind of sort of working uh, and you might want to defer some bugs, but no, you're getting, you're getting test reports saying, Hey, here's a problem, right? Well, I know there's a problem there. I haven't got there yet. Uh, but uh, overall, I think it's a, a good thing. James isn't happy about lockdown, it seems. <laughs> Tell us what we really think, James. Come on. Uh, and a lot of people aren't happy with the kernel concurrency sanitizer, but I, I like it a lot. It's found a lot of bugs for me. It's, it's really cool. It finds false positives, too, but I'm willing to take those. Go ahead, James. False positives are becoming the bane of our lives. The more testing we get, the more false positives we get. I can foresee a time when we'll spend all of our waking hours dealing with just false positives and there won't be any real bugs left in the universe. Um, and I guess what that says is that we should be uh, working to try to uh, automatically classify or get rid of the false positives. Uh, there were some changes to LockDep to reduce false positives. Uh, and RCU uses them. There's, uh, it, by default, the uh, combining tree, the RCU node tree locks would give me lock depth warnings all the time. But there's an API, which I don't remember the name of, where I can say, hey, even though these locks look the same, I can make the layers of the tree be in different lock classes. Uh, so if we're having false positives, there's some way we can make lock depth recognize those. Uh, uh, there's a false positive I, I came up with uh, this morning. Uh, in SRCU of all things, so a tiny SRCU. It's saying, hey, if you have two CPUs, this deadlock can happen. It's like, but I've only got one CPU, otherwise I'm not running tiny SRCU. Uh, in this case, it's okay because uh, quite frankly, uh, the I can break the deadlock by getting rid of a class of, of uh, false of redundant wakeups. So I may as well just fix it that way, but I can see where that could be annoying. Go ahead, James. Well. I was going to say, I think the key point is to ensure that you have more actual cases than you have false positives and you're reducing false negatives. It's a bit like spam processing. If you look at crap mail services like Hotmail or Outlook, which basically just rejected all of the Linux plumbers mass mailing lists, it's the false positives that really kill you. Once you get beyond a certain level of false positives, the service becomes useless. And we have to make sure with all of 
testing and fuzzing things that we don't reach that point. That's the point at which developers tire of them, they turn off the service because basically false positive, you're drowning in false positives and you don't have enough real signal to make any headway with it. I mean, technically that's what happened with Coverity scanning the kernel. So, so that's, a, I mean, that's an excellent point. That. That's an excellent point, but I'd like to apply different, another level of nuance. And I'm gonna pick on uh, kernel concurrency sanitizer. Uh, because that, there's been a lot of complaints about kernel concurrency sanitizer false positives. Now, I, my, in many cases, I think that the developers are just not appreciating what compilers can do to them. But still, as you say, if, they, if it causes them enough trouble, enough perceived trouble from their viewpoint, they're going to turn it off. So what we did in that case is by default, what we did is we listened to them. And to the extent we could, we had uh, cake and fig parameters to allow shutting off the complaints that they consider false positive. For example, um, if you if you rewrite a variable with the same value it had before, uh, KC San used to complain about that. By default now it says that's ah, the same value. There's a write, but nobody can possibly notice, so forget it. We're not going to worry. All right, and so that's and so by default it there's a bunch of things it doesn't warn about. Now for RCU, uh, to your point, I'm willing to take a 20 to one false positive rate, just because the real bugs are so damaging in RCU. Okay, now. In SCSI, maybe it's different, or in, in HPEA, maybe it's different. That's fine, you know, me versus you, and we should be able to make a different choice. So uh, Marco gave me a KC San underbar strict KCVIG option, which I said in RCU torture. And then I ignore the uh, reports from the rest of the kernel. Not automatically yet, but to your point, I'll have to get there at some point because I manually have to manually look at them. But I, th I, think, I think that what we have to do is be able to adapt the tools to the uh, because if you have a really sever high severity bug, a high impact bug, uh, a higher false positive rate is justified. If the bugs are low impact, then you then you want to pay a lot more attention to your false positives, and it may vary from subsystem to subsystem. Go ahead. Yep, I, I, I agree with what you said. I mean, I'm not advocating we have to get rid of all false positives before we find the test useful, but we have to get the false positives under control. Even for you, yes. there is a rate of false positives beyond which you will find the test useless. Yeah, hundred percent. For one thing, if it's only false positives, not telling me, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's it's excellent point. It's difficult. It's going to vary from place to place. But I think what you're what what we're saying is that uh, in the testing phase, we may have gotten a point where we need to put some effort into reducing false positives for some of the popular uh, test things. Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you again for your time and attention the questions and discussion. It was really great. And, uh, you know, have a wonderful rest of the conference. And, uh, you know, uh, see you guys in later sessions. <laughs>